previously on Science for All. What is the geometry of these other things? And what would it be like to be living on these underpants? And now the answer. Years and years and years ago, a legendary figure stated five self-evident truths which he claimed all of the truths should be derived from. And for 2,000 years and more, generations of intellectuals would indeed derive wonderful facts from these five self-evident truths. The only problem is that these truths are not that self-evident. In fact, they are contradicted by my underpants. The legendary figure I'm talking about is the great Euclid, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. He was a Greek scholar who basically founded the whole of geometry, or at least of Euclidean geometry. This Euclidean geometry, as we now call it, relies on Euclid's five postulates. And they really seem obvious when you look at them, to the point that many mathematicians were actually trying to prove the fifth of them from the fourth first postulate. But there are geometries in which this fifth postulate is actually false. Wait, what's this fifth postulate? Well, it says that if I give you one line and one point, you can always find one and exactly one other line that goes through this point and that never intersects the line I started with. Pretty obvious, right? Well, no. So on my underpants, I've actually drawn here some lines using strings. Now suppose that I give you this line here and I tell you to draw another line through this point here that never intersects this line. Well, actually, you're going to have an infinite number of possibilities. There are infinitely many lines that go through this point right here and never intersect this one right here. I've actually drawn two of them right here. And you can see that the reason why there are many such lines is because the lines curve away from one another. So this line right here that seems like it should cross our original line will actually curve away from the line we started with. Now when you really think about it, it is not that surprising that there should be such a surface like that. After all, we've already discussed in the previous episode the geometry of the sphere. Do you remember? On the sphere, any two lines always intersect at two antipodal locations. So Euclid's fifth postulate does not even hold on the sphere. And now the geometry of my underpants is sort of the opposite of that. Instead of always intersecting, lines tend to never intersect. Now these geometries in which straight lines tend to curve away from one another are called negatively curved geometries or hyperbolic geometries. Unfortunately, my underpants are not a very good example of hyperbolic geometry. For one thing, it doesn't go for infinity, like there are these edges. And more importantly, it's not hyperbolic everywhere. I mean, right here in the back, it's quite negatively curved, but in the front, it's actually positively curved. So in the early 19th century, when some geniuses like Lobachevsky, Bolyai, and Gauss started to envision the possibility of this hyperbolic geometry, they were puzzled about how to represent it, how to make an actual model of this hyperbolic geometry in our three-dimensional space. And they just couldn't figure it out. Well, amazingly, the answer didn't come from mathematicians, it came from biologists. Yes, that's right, nature has come up with a hyperbolic geometry on its own, namely on coral reefs. Coral reefs are hyperbolic planes. Yeah, that's crazy! And as you can see on these coral reefs, this hyperbolic plane tends to be rippled in all directions, as though it was taking more space than the Euclidean plane, and in some sense, does. Now, however beautiful coral reefs are, and they really are beautiful, it's not very easy to understand hyperbolic geometry by looking at them. But we don't need to have an extrinsic viewpoint on it. Riemann would show that you could think of it intrinsically, to think what it would be like to be living in a hyperbolic plane. So what would it be like to be living in the hyperbolic plane? 
Well, there's a wonderful video of Dick Canary on number five that explains what it would be like to be playing sports on the hyperbolic plane. I particularly like the example of playing golf. If you're trying to hit a swing, then if you make even a teeny tiny mistake of the angle, then you might end up light years apart from the hole. In fact, if the hyperbolic plane is highly curved, it's quite likely that after hitting the ball, even though you're giving it the right power and you're only deviating by a teeny tiny angle, you may well end up further away from the hole than you were before hitting the ball. So if you're actually playing golf in a hyperbolic plane, don't just try to hit it in one shot, just try to get a bit closer by hitting it with a small amount of power and just making sure that you're getting closer, which is already such a hard thing to do in hyperbolic geometry. More generally, if you're living in a hyperbolic plane, you're going to find out that it's very difficult to find your way. When you deviate your trajectory by a little bit, you may end up in a totally different place. And that's because in hyperbolic geometry, the space one mile away from you is much bigger than it is in Euclidean geometry. I'm sorry, but I still don't understand what this hyperbolic plane is. Well, we've tried the extrinsic viewpoint, and here we've tried also the intrinsic viewpoint. But there's a third way that we've discussed in length in the previous video, namely using map. So can we use a map of the hyperbolic plane? Well, first I should say that Gauss' Theorema Egregium guarantees that we cannot find a perfect map of the hyperbolic plane. Plane. But maybe we can come up with a conformal map. And in fact, I'm going to present to you my favorite conformal map of the hyperbolic plane. It's called Poincaré's map. Although I shouldn't call it the Poincaré map because the Poincaré map is something else. Yeah, that's the problem with mathematicians that Poincaré that did so many things. So the idea of the Poincaré projection is kind of the opposite of the Mercator projection. Remember, in the Mercator projection, in order to make it conformal, we had to stretch the countries near the boundaries of the map. Well, in the Poincaré projection, we're going to do the exact opposite. Namely, the spaces that are near the boundary of the map are going to be shrunk. In fact, they're going to be infinitely shrunk. To illustrate that, imagine you're driving a car in this hyperbolic plane and let us draw you well you would appear big in the middle where distances are sort of normal but when you're getting close to the edge because the distances are shrunk your car is also going to shrink in fact it's going to be shrinking too fast for it to ever reach the boundary of the Poincaré projection now an important concept of geometry is obviously the concept of straight lines so what do straight lines look like on the Poincaré projection. Remember, on the Mercator projection, straight lines tend to go near the poles where the distances are enlarged. The Poincaré map is going to be the opposite. Straight lines will appear as curving closer to the middle where distances are enlarged. There's more than that. In fact, Poincaré showed that in his projection, straight lines would be exactly circles that are perpendicular to the boundaries of the map. So if I give you three corners of a triangle, if you want to draw the triangle that corresponds to these three corners, you're going to have to draw the pieces of circles that are perpendicular to the boundary of the map and that go through two of the three points. This gives you this triangle. Now remember that this map is actually conformal, which means that the angles in this figure are the same as the angles in the actual hyperbolic plane. So we can actually measure the sum of the angles of the triangle in the hyperbolic plane by measuring them on this map. And what you can see is that clearly the sum of the angles of the triangle is going to be always less than 180 degrees. Once again, it's kind of the opposite of what's happening in spherical geometry, where the sum of the angles of triangles always exceed 180 degrees. So how small can the sum of the angles of a triangle be on the hyperbolic plane? Well, if you just throw the three corners at infinity, you're trying to make the triangle as large as possible. 
then the angles will actually go to zero. Yes, that's right, in the hyperbolic plane, you have these ideal triangles whose angles are zero. And yet, the areas of these triangles is always going to be finite. And that's so weird. The areas of any triangle in hyperbolic geometry is always finite, even when you throw the corners at infinity. And that's only one of the many cool facts that hyperbolic geometry has to offer. And I'm going to wrap up with a quote by Janos Broliai, one of the co-inventors of hyperbolic geometry. In a letter to his father, he wrote, Out of nothing, I created a new, strange universe. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. This was the last one of our series on geometry. We'll talk again about geometry, but for now I want to go back to physics because, as I've said, I'm building up to talk about the theory of general relativity. And next time we're going to talk about Galileo, who was the first one to really get a, an interesting grasp on the theory of gravity. And in particular, the question I want you to think about is do heavier objects fall faster? Here I have a small ball, here I have a bigger ball. What do you think? So, do heavy objects fall faster? This is what I want you to think about for next time. Please share this video if you enjoyed it. Please, please share to your friends. Uh, that's very important for this uh, channel, for the success of this channel. You can also subscribe to this channel, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google+, Plus, uh, send me messages. Uh, wishing me uh, good luck or whatever. I've also put a link here to uh, number five videos about uh, this uh, hyperbolic geometry which are pretty good and I hope I'll see you next time.